Hi. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can everybody hear me without this, or is this, is this going to interfere with the videography if I don't speak into the microphone, Eric? You sound good. I'm good? Oh, thank you. I sound good. Uh, okay. I am a Dublin-based graphic designer, uh, but I was born here in New York, and uh, I've lived here for most of my life. Uh, and uh, for most of that time, I had a pretty generalist practice in design. Uh, I did branding, print, some interactive, some packaging, and uh, a bit of illustration. I did a fair variety of jobs, and I liked it that way. I've always drawn letters since I was a teenager, and over the years, I taught myself lettering techniques so I could draw my own word marks properly. But as time went by, I got more and more interested in type design and lettering as an end to itself. Now, this would be some of the branding stuff that I've done. Uh, this is for Cochrane a large Seattle-based construction firm specializing in uh, electrical and communications. I've done brochures for them. I did their branding for them. Here's uh, capabilities brochure. Die-cut New Year's card. They were real sports to go for this one. Um, and then 20-foot illuminated branding pylon, which was very satisfying to do because it was the first time I'd ever been able to do make something that if it fell on you, it would kill you. <laughs> uh, which is kind of nice if you spend, as most of us do, your life making things that are either just pixels or are held together with staples. So that was nice. For a while, I was a uh, creative director at a hedge fund and VC fund called D.E. Shaw. Uh, our our lobby, our, our offices were designed by Stephen Hall and won a silver AIA medal for them. They were literally in every major architecture magazine around the world. They were beautiful. They were hell to work in. And uh, because when, you know, a genius like Stephen Hall designs your lobby, you don't stick your ugly ass vulgar logo up on it. So what we came up with was a solution where we cut it out of stainless steel and inlaid it into the floor. And I had to draw a special version of it that was sturdy enough to be cut out of 3 8 inch stainless. We tried to keep the logoing subtle. This is the letterhead, uh, where we actually had a custom make of paper with a logoed watermark. And there's nothing, you know, less cool than a logoed mug, but I always like these. Uh, hard case crime is something I put together with a friend of mine. So to a certain extent, this is self-initiated. Uh, it's basically meant to be uh, some of the best of the old style pulp paperback hard-boiled novels, uh, republished in their a style approximating their original glory, and a few new ones written in the style of the old. So uh, this was not an Exercise in Modernist Purity. You wrote uh, some of those? Pardon me? You wrote some of those? I wrote one of those, actually. I saw your name on uh, Yeah, yeah, Faye to Blonde. That was, uh, to prime the pump, I actually wrote one myself. It was called Fade to Blonde, and I wrote it more or less accidentally. I was doing a presentation uh, for my partner about what I thought the covers ought to look like. And I wasn't going to use the Maltese Falcon or whomever because we weren't publishing the stuff that was already in print. We were finding the stuff that was unfair, unfairly neglected. And we were all, so I made up a title that just sounded right. You know, Fade to Blonde. She was a little taste of heaven and a one-way ticket to hell. <laughs> and I started faking up a cover. And while I was doing it, I started thinking, hmm. If somebody actually wrote this, I wonder what it would be like. And so this is when I was the creative director at D.E. Shaw, so I actually put aside that work and sometime around nine in the, in the evening started writing a first chapter. And around seven the next morning, I had finished the chapter and outlined you know, the first half of the book, and thought, well, let's have a really cold shower, because I'm going to go to work now. And that's how I wrote the book. It was a lot of fun. This, this cocktail waitress 
was a, a lost novel by James M. Cain, the last novel he ever wrote, which had never been published because it was so goddamned awful. He was, you know, dying of alcoholic toxemia at the time. And my friend edited it so that it was publishable. Anyhow, so I got to do a fair amount of lettering through all of this. And uh, yeah, Stephen King actually wrote two books for us. He liked what we were doing, and he wrote them for essentially no money up front and essentially 100% of the royalties. This one was set in an old-time amusement park, and I felt great. Classic show card lettering. I love it. Let's do it. And uh, the Random House people who did our distribution showed it at the sales meeting, and they said, no, can't do that. Stephen King always has sans serif type. It's like, okay, well, this time he won't. And it's like, how will they know it's the same Stephen King? <laughs> <sighs> but I still like the lettering. And Michael Crichton, who we didn't have to uh, argue with because he was dead. Uh, this is a brand for a startup called Level. I designed the uh, UI for them, which I still can't show because of the NDA, because they haven't launched. And until they launch, I can't show anything. But the title page, of, uh, the home page of the website I did for them, this is uh, for women, but eventually for men, so that they would be able to uh, track some of their own biomarkers if they were interested in uh, getting pregnant. And. Uh, there's the business card and the branding pattern, uh, all of which come from the hash marks in the logo where the V uh, forms a pointer. F.A. Schwartz uh, was the last job I ever had. I was creative director there. I streamlined the logo a bit. We, we created a brand, a stripe that was meant to be the branding pattern because we really, there were too many different constituencies and too many different markets for us to pick just one color and try to own it. But stripes can be fine, stripes can be bold, stripes can be, you know, color on color, they can be day glow, you can do a lot with stripes. This is the gift wrap we designed. I wasn't at this photo shoot. Our catalog director was, and apparently he said that the little girl they hired required no coaching. She was brought onto the set, she ran and grabbed one of the presents and just started messing with it. She was so excited, Pressies! And made this wonderful, and made this wonderful photo, which I can claim no credit for, but I did design a gift wrap. Uh, I actually wound up doing toys for them. These are sustainably harvested rubber wood, and this is a stacker with interchangeable heads based on some character design I did for them, some various graphics. And like I said, eventually I got more seriously into type design. Spinoza is the first typeface I ever published with the late lamented font font. And uh, it was meant to be elegant, quiet, and a workhorse, something that would be very sturdy, something that would work across platforms, and something that would be intensely readable. And I worked on it for 11 years, and at the end of that was so nuts with frustration that I took off a few weeks and designed Vibro, uh, one of the least readable typefaces ever made, uh, with some, I like to think, some fairly unusual ligatures, like that double M, and a range of uh, ornaments that I was pretty sure that no one would ever use, but I enjoyed doing. And a manicure, because I like <laughs> manicures. I really like manicures. Center was the next one I published under my own imprint, uh, a squarish technical sans. Uh, I did a slab version of it. And uh, it led to another one called Precio, which was uh, sort of done backwards. Basically, I started with the ultra-compressed extra black weight. That's the first thing I drew. And then I squashed it down vertically until I got to the regular width. And then I hollowed it out from the inside to make the regular weights. And by the time I got done, there were 
you know, five weights, four widths, 20 styles, and it had become quite an undertaking. So, of course, it needed a stencil companion to create another 40 weights, and the stencil companion, which you see over here, needed a stencil manicule. <laughs> I cannot tell you how guilty I get working for really absurdly long amounts of time on these manicules, knowing that they're not making me any money and my, you know, children are outside the door crying for bread. <laughs> uh, Christie's world, uh, world's oldest auction house. This one is particularly important for me or significant because this is the first time I ever crafted a logo for some other designer. When I, by the time I did this, I'd been a creative director for some years, and I was specialized in building and running in-house departments, something that I stink at and hate. I like being a designer, and I think I'm fairly good at it. I hate being a manager, and I am wretched at it. But a friend of mine, a, who had once, who had, a former design director at Christie's who had gone freelance, was pitching the New York office for a, for a refresh. And they wanted to go back to the old lockup that they had lost in the 1994 Carbone Smolin rebrand and just make it a bit more distinctive. And she knew what she wanted but she didn't feel like she drew well enough to do it on her own, so she asked me to collaborate. And because she was a friend, it's like, I've been a creative director for a while, and it's like the idea, it's been a while since I had designed stuff the way somebody told me to do it, unless they were a client. And I wasn't looking forward to this, frankly, but she was a buddy, and, you know, it sounded interesting, so I did it, and I found that I loved it. I loved the collaboration. And uh, at the bottom is what we came up with. Uh, uh, James Christie, the founder, needed to be uh, needed to be readable uh, as 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 a portrait. You needed to recognize his face at a quarter of an inch across on the business cards. The foundation date needed to work in three point five type, and the Christies needed to be the Christies. She sent me to. St. Paul's Chapel in Lower Manhattan, where George Washington went to church on Sundays, and said, would you look at that memorial wall? Because the carved letters there are the feeling I want, the mood I want. And look out for that Prada R that they have. And I would never have thought of any of that, but it really worked. There's a close-up of the man himself and his cornrows, the bag that was never produced, and the cards that were never produced because... Uh, once the New York office saw this, they loved it, sent it to London for the final buy-in, and it got shot down. And we were never paid. Around this time, I met Kirsten. She was a fashion designer from Dublin who'd come to New York after a few years of running her own label to get experience in a major fashion city. And I must have been more persuasive than I usually am because she stayed 10 years. And uh, after we'd been married a while, a couple of things happened. We had a baby, and the economy collapsed. One right after the other. So, it was the worst downturn in 75 years. FAO, where I was creative director, was sold to a competitor, and everyone from the CEO on down hit the streets. Uh, and Ben was three months old, and nobody was returning my calls, and nobody was returning my emails, uh, including people whom I thought of as sort of professionally friends. I had been laid off, and nobody wanted to catch it from me. So I very quickly learned that there were no shortage of middle-aged creative directors in New York, and I learned something else. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I've been complaining about the pressure in New York to hyper-specialize, because this is such a huge mark that clients are able to find studios that who have done nothing for years but exactly the kind of work that they're in the market for. <laughs> and if you don't know that much about design, this does seem like a sensible way to do procurement. This is from an actual want ad that I read while I was looking for work, and it always stuck in my mind. I did not make this up. I wish I had. Um, I heard another story from a friend 
uh, worked at a packaging, uh, a uh, packaging design agency who had a soap client. They'd been designing boxes for their soap flakes for God knows how many years. And they lost the account. Why, they asked the client. They said, well, we want to introduce a, a, a liquid product, you know, and we need somebody with liquid soap packaging experience. <laughs> <laughs> so I found that nobody wanted to hire me or even interview me for any role other than in-house creative director at a toy brand. And the competitor who had just brought FAO wasn't answering my emails either. I thought I might get a job as a creative director in a big branding agency, but no, because I'd never been a creative director in a big branding agency. There was no work anywhere I could see. And on top of this, after 10 years away from Ireland, Kirsten was homesick. <laughs> so we decided to move to Ireland. <laughs> Ireland took some getting used to. For one thing, it's small. The whole island is about six million people. Uh, the Republic is four and a half. Um, the design in industry is mostly concentrated in central Dublin, which is about half a million. That's the size of uh, Tucson, and it's one sixteenth the size of New York City. Um, so it's different. The, the fact that it's so small makes the industry more personal and more driven by relationships. The designers all went to school together, and so did the clients. Um, and also, graphic design only really became a well-established profession in Ireland in the 1980s. Before that, they'd mostly either given it out to moonlighting painters or sent it overseas, uh, frequently to London. So it's a lot. It's a younger design community than New York City. In New York City, it's less institutional and it's less sure of itself. It was a different culture. And I had a lot to learn. <laughs> Part of the difference in culture has to do with a sense of nation. There may only be six million people living on the island, but depending on how you count it, there's 70 or 80 million Irish people in the world, people who identify as Irish. Um, so Ireland is both a very small nation and quite a big one. Can that include Irish setters? Pardon me? Can that include Irish setters? I'll have to check that. Uh, Maybe somebody in the back who has fast thumbs could Google it. Uh, in addition, Irish culture is very old, but the nation is very new. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, it was under colonial rule and fairly brutal colonial rule. And part of that colonial rule was the systematic eradication of the Irish language and Irish culture to replace with English language and culture. Uh, Ireland only left the Commonwealth in 1948. So, there's a lot of people in Ireland who actually remember the founding of the nation. Uh, and I, I think the sense of history might have something to do with, with the fact that I think Irish clients engage with Irishness much more than I find American clients engage with Americanness. You know, if you're dealing with a big Irish client, one of the central questions is always, how do we make this Irish and still modern? Or how do we make this Irish and traditional? Or even, you know, how Irish do we want to make this? You know, American clients act as if everyone was American. That's not a question they engage with. They don't ask themselves stuff about that. Uh, because Irish design is by and large concentrated in one smallish city, there's much less pressure to specialize. Uh, now, I have by choice been specializing more and more, but in Dublin you just get a chance at a wider variety of things than you do in New York. Uh, it also makes the practice of design more personal. My God, I've been talking for a long time, apparently. Come back. Uh, you know, in the States, most of the... Uh, contacts that I have have come through formal structures, uh, jobs I've worked at, uh, you know, schools I've gone to. In Ireland, you know, I met Connor Nolan of work group after I'd been there three weeks. I ran into him on the bus. And while I was trying to figure out a way to 
worm my way into a studio, he was saying, you should come by the studio. What's your next week look like? And that is, that kind of welcome is, and uh, that, uh, that kind of going from point A to point B through personal relationships face to face is something that I found very, very typical of Ireland. Uh, another of the first designers I came, uh, I came into contact with was Simon Richards at Richards D. And after I'd been there about a year, he offered me uh, the chance to redraw the Bewley's logo. I don't know, Bewley's coffee may not be a big deal over here, but it is an iconic brand in Ireland. It's very good, actually. And Ireland, I don't, if you're not, if you're not from there, you don't know it, but the Irish take their coffee very, very seriously. Um, it's a big coffee city. And uh, in fact, it's a lot easier to get a good cup of coffee in Ireland than it is in New York, I found. Um, so this is something where they wanted to refresh this, but again, they were afraid of changing it too much. This is the old logo that some London agency did back in the early 90s. They wanted this to the same but better. <laughs> and in particular, they really wanted this to be something that did well small and did well on screen. Um, because increasingly they were moving into not just selling coffee and not just running a handful of cafes, but B2B solutions where they set up coffee operations for other brands and run them. Um, and that's where the serious money is. So it was an interesting challenge to take this, to take the fairly wretched drawing of the top one and regularize it, make it sturdier without losing the character of it, and also get it to where it was readable at very small sizes. This is an enlargement of their Twitter icon. It is 71 pixels across and it still reads, and I have to say I'm very proud of that. We couldn't do anything for the 1840, but you know, <laughs> still. Uh, here's some packaging. Again, I was, I was brought in as a hired hand to work over the logo. The packaging is theirs. The branding system is theirs. They are the one who, you know, put this logo on this coffee cup. Much too big, but nobody asked me. Here is another bit of uh, engaging with Irishness, the Book of Kells, which is, you know, one of the... It's like, uh, it would be for Ireland what the Liberty Bell, or the original Declaration of Independence, is for the United States. It's also a huge moneymaker for Trin Trinity College, where it is housed. They wanted to update it. Uh, it has a pretty awful logo that, again, was designed somewhere in London some time ago. Uh, Zero G, who does a lot of government work, brought me in and showed me what you see on the top. That wasn't the logo. That was a placeholder logo. They had sold in the concept of a relatively lightweight sans serif. Okay? They, they had sold in the concept of something that wasn't going to be diddly eye, but they wanted to give it a slight Irish lilt, and they knew that it was a very much a letter focused thing, and they wanted the specialists to do it. So we had a great time. I mean, they and I worked back and forth until we came up with what you see at the bottom. And here it is on the video display wall in the entrance. Um, and something like this, can you make it a little bit Irish, but still modern? That's one of the biggest requests that I get. Um, here's another one. There used to be 160, I think, distillery, distilleries in Ireland. And during the course of the late 19th to early 20th century, through consolidation and through the bigger ones elbowing the other ones aside, it came down to something like four, you know, and now Diageo, you know, who make Guinness um, run everything. Recently, there's been an upsurge of people who basically buy the names and the rights to old distilleries mm -hmm. and relaunch them. And they also, of course, have to buy stock. They may build a new distillery, but you can't, you know, like start up the whiskey machine and have drinkable whiskey at the end of it. Uh, you know, so they need to buy whiskey from somebody as well. Matt Darcy's uh, ran uh, a distillery up by the, what is currently the border uh, between the north and the south. 
And what we had was this drawing of the bottle. And I was actually brought, first brought in to work on the type, but then asked to do packaging treatments. So, first thing I did was I started with the bottle, the shape of the bottle, which is very unusual, not like anything you've seen on a shelf before. And I wanted to see how simple could we make it. Everybody said iconic, iconic. I tried to make something which, even if you could barely see, you would know was a bottle of Matt Darcy's. I knew that there was some market for Victoriana, so that with uh, that would have been just a public domain Victorian gentleman or Edwardian gentleman. Uh, we don't actually know what Matt Darcy looked like. Here's another one where I thought, well, I'll explain, I'll explore some other bottles. And all the time I was looking for something that would be a stick in the ground for the premium product, and then that could be sort of brought down to earth for the stuff on supermarket shelves. And what I was basically told was, nah, you did it wrong. This is basically a, going to be a supermarket shelf product, mostly aimed at Americans who don't know much about Irish whiskey. And this, you know, they're, they're, if there's a premium product, it'll be a loss leader to make people feel better about the supermarket shelf product that makes the money. So I got the brief completely wrong, and all of this was discarded. Here, by the way, is the, uh, my quick refresh of the old, uh, this is actually above the gate of the distillery, the harp and the crown and the, you know, shamrocks and the ribbons and the rest of it and the crown. Because at that point, it, you know, the, the association with uh, English royalty wasn't quite as toxic as it would later be. So, uh, anyhow, I can show you this now because it's all been rejected. Uh, and uh, it's over a year now, and they are still trying to find, with different designers, the right form for the bottle. Uh, here is another something entirely else. My friend Paul Guinan, a very fine young designer, has a side hustle, which he calls Sunday Books. And sundaybooks.ie, he probably doesn't have a lot of American customers, but he is well worth looking into. He just always wanted a bookstore. And so this is about design books and magazines that otherwise it would be difficult to find in Ireland. He had at the top, the, the, the top is what he launched with, and he wanted something with Scotch modern roots. And so he went with Miller, pretty much straight out of the car, and because it's got Scotch roots, and it's, you know, like everything that Carter draws, it's really well drawn. But he realized it winds up looking very generic. You know, it winds up looking like it's set in Georgia. It, it looks like a, like a skinny default bond. So uh, he talked to me, and we started looking into other forms. The brief here was, Reference librarian who DJs on the weekends. And uh, this is the website that he designed himself. And there's the logo, of, and as you can see, he's doing some business because he's selling some of this stuff out. And like I said, Sunday Books IE, it's worth looking into, and I'm not getting a percentage. Carl Scarpa does not sound like an Irish legacy brand, uh, and it only goes back to 1974, but actually it is. This is actually the cousin of the famous Italian architect, Carlo Scarpa, who wanted to be a boot maker. And for some reason, he thought that Dublin was the place to do that. So he moved to Dublin and opened up uh, a shoe store and uh, was for a while a very hot brand and then sort of settled into a brand for people who have sensible women who have sensible tastes and who don't want their feet to hurt. And in fact, the stuff is very well made, but not necessarily always the most stylish. Um, so uh, they uh, asked Catalyst DNA to help refresh the brand. Um, and Catalyst um, asked me to step in and try to lead that project. That's the old mark on the top which they really, we, we proposed other things to them, but they didn't want to move too far from that. And that is that on the bottom. Once again, we wanted it to be more readable, especially at small sizes. I'm big on readability at small sizes because I think in most cases, you should be logoing less and smaller. Um, 
which of course is not what they wound up doing when they when they actually did that. They the first thing they did was they took their shop on Grafton Street, which has something like a 16 foot frontage and put a polished brass 14 foot logo on it. So that was about how much influence I had over the way these things went. Here is the shopping bag uh, art. Again, I'm showing the art here because I'm still waiting for them to produce the shopping bags. Uh, the blue and gray color ways we worked out together. And the patterns, I thought it would be good to have a library of patterns that they could draw on. I wanted originally to, to design them all myself. I like pattern design, but the time and money weren't there. These were both publicly available, but here were some of the things that I designed for them on my own. And that uh, they actually did buy. But like I said, I'm still waiting for anything to come of this but that enormous glaring uh, sign on the facade. I was talking to, so where are you, about the salvage press, Jamie Murphy? Hi. Oh, hi. Yes. Uh, Jamie Murphy is somebody who used to be a corporate designer and who uh, grew dissatisfied with just the dryness and the unphysicalness of doing everything on a screen for uh, creation by outside manufacturers. And he taught himself to set type and to be a letterpress printer and is now one of our, running one of Ireland's finest small presses. He wanted, this is a new mark, this is his press mark, he wanted something that he could put quite small, quite discreet, discreet on the colophon page of his books. And he gave me a bunch of grabs of Jan van Krimpen monograms to use as inspiration. So, of course, we were friends right away. You know, it's like, yeah, that's, you know, if you're going to ask me to knock off anybody, ask me to knock off Jan van Krimpen. I won't do it well, but it's nice. It's fun to try. So here's, here, here's some of the pencils that I... Uh, gave to him. And this is what we wound up with. We wound up with two variations of the mark. Well, sort of a plain one and a fancy one, depending, so that uh, you could have uh, different marks to suit different moods. And here it is in operation. And Jamie is a purist. He doesn't go for polymer plates. Okay? So this is a zinc cut of the mark which is a lovely little thing to uh, look at. <laughs> okay, this is the Irish Post Office. And I was brought in by a firm called Image Now to consult on it. They had designed the logo at the top. And that were, those were the vectors they gave me. Um, and they knew it needed a bit of refinement, although I don't think they knew how much. Uh, what's on the bottom is what they finally signed off on, although you'll notice, if you've got a retentive memory, that the T actually sprouted that little extra bit of crossbar again because they, uh, Image Now said, yeah, you're right, that ST combination works better. And they showed it to the client who said, that's not what we signed off on. We're not going to send this all the way through all those committees again, you know. Put it back so that there's no there's uh, no controversy, which is something that if you do the kind of logo massaging that I do, you very frequently run into, because you will come in there and you will find that people have already signed off on something that might. Well, here it's something of a matter of taste. Is you know that tea is not that tea could be made to work, I guess. But there are times when there's just flat out typographic malpractice, and you fix it, and they say no. You know, can't be that. You know, it's like the middle arm of that, you know, E is way, way too short. It looks like it was designed in, you know, 1810, you know, and you're trying to look modern. It's like, no, that's, that, they, they signed off on it that short. Put it back that short. It's been, all right. Had a little bit more freedom with the uh, branding face, which uh, came in two weights. And again, here we once again have the idea of, how can we have something with a bit of an Irish, not a brogue, just a lilt to it that still looks modern? That can frequently turn out very badly. 
uh, if you look at the Aerolink, recent Aerolingus rebrand, which was done here in the States. But in this case, I think we brought it off, and in fact, we didn't get the kind of public, public thrashing that these kinds of rebrands usually get in Ireland. And here, again, this is not my branding system. This is ImageNow. This is their web website design, their vehicle livery, uh, just using the logo that I helped them craft and the typefaces I designed for them, and some signage. The Royal Irish, the Royal Institute of Irish Architects, which I can't get my head around, um, is the sanctioning body in Ireland for architects. And this is, we're talking about uh, Connor Nolan of Work Group. There were a few years in between him meeting me on the bus and them calling me in to do this. They knew that the, they wanted to move away from that lovely specimen on the top, but not too far away. So they had already sold in the color. And uh, when I came along and all that they knew was it needed to be a Gerald. It needed to be a fairly traditional Roman typeface, not a Sans, you know, not a, not Didon. And uh, we just iterated and iterated. And it also, it needs to be something that works very small, partly because this is something that people use on their websites and even their business cards to show that they're members. And uh, so it needed to be a little bug off in the corner and still read. So we made this dirty. Here is some of the applications that I had nothing to do with. The incredibly gifted people at work group did this. Office paper and brochures. And here is a very interesting thing that I did for Publicis Dublin. This is a campaign typeface that they did for Virgin Mobile. The creative director had found something he liked on Defunct. <laughs> <laughs> now, in fairness to Jero, he it was one of these god awful auto traced uh, handwriting fonts, and the spacing there were just in the side bearings were like ten units on either side of every single character. That way, it, you know it'll come out nice and even. <laughs> Anyhow, in fairness, I thought, okay, big deep breath, you need to learn the facts of life, but actually he was way ahead of me. He knew that it was garbage. And he had already contacted the designer, if you want to call it that, licensed it from him properly, and got permission for them to completely re redraw it. All right, fine. So, could I redraw it and could I do it? Fast. So I did, and uh, it's sort of uh, it's sort of a challenge uh, that I wound up quite enjoying taking this god awful auto traced font. I mean everything. I mean there's not a single vector that I was able to use. Uh, you know it's a complete redraw, but in a way it's great because you could see right away they gave you a swipe that gave that had exactly the personality, exactly the weight they wanted. And so I was able to move very fast through this because I didn't have to say a little bit more like this, a little bit less like that. I knew I could just redraw these things. There was no money for alternates, uh, but it's not quite as important when it's only being used for headlines, although they used free quite a bit. Every time I see those two E's, oh, I die a little inside. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, there you go. It's uh, once again these. This is an ad that they did. Uh, didn't have anything to do with the ad. I don't have that on my conscience. But it's actually cool to work in an aesthetic that you yourself would never choose and see how well can I, how well can I bring this off? How deeply can I get into this? And they're really lovely people to work with. They uh, hey. Here, Arnett's, which is the uh, very old and uh, storied Dublin department store. Here is a different, different approach. Zero G, uh, the same people I worked with on Book of Kells, brought me in. But here, it wasn't to collaborate in the sense of, you know, pushing a sheet of tracing paper back and forth across a the desk. They called me in and said, uh, Jason, the hunty, 
and said, we've got a mark, we've sold it in, it's 90% there, we need you to take it the rest of the way. And I thought, <laughs> 90%, I'll be the judge of that, thank you. <laughs> and then he showed it to me, and I thought, like, oh, 90% there. <laughs> so here, this is a very subtle polishing job because it was 90% there. They'd made the aesthetic decisions. I thought they were great aesthetic decisions. I bought into them wholeheartedly. And it's just sort of like, how can I do what you're trying to do a little bit better than you've got the skills to do it? And uh, here's the bag, which uh, is... Uh, you see God knows how many of these on the streets of Dublin, and it makes a very nice impression. It's just a nice job. So, I mean, even within the same firm, there are all different levels of collaboration. Everything from, you know, can you design this for us? You know, here's the brief. Two, we have designed this. We know exactly what you want. Can you give it, you know, a French polish before it goes out the door? And all those things can be a lot of fun. Here, uh, you don't often get to rebrand a major Irish poet. This was, I didn't actually know what this was for when I did it, because uh, this is another Richard D. job. The NDA was just out the door. It was a very, it, this was a job for, I found it was for Irish fairies. The, uh, one of their, uh, these sort of like the uh, flagship of their fleet is the W.B. Yates. And they uh, had a signature that they wanted to use. Now, what you're seeing at the top is the, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of Yates signatures out there. And some of them in better nick than this. But here we have something which was pretty rough to begin with. And then somebody auto traced it. And then somebody, rasterized it at a very low resolution, and then somebody said, here, can you use this signature? And the people at Richard D, you know, told them, hell no, but we know somebody who can redraw it. So one of the things about working in this collaborative way and also working in a place where you're going to be offered more different kinds of jobs is you have to be flexible. And I thought, okay, this is kind of cool. So I redrew it. Um, you see there, if you look closely, that little sort of roughness uh, of the ink line. I didn't do it in ink. I put that in with using filters and then edited the filters so that it wouldn't, you know, it would have different amounts of roughness. And we also did a dead smooth version of this for use when you had to cut it in vinyl and you couldn't have lots of little jaggies. But that was a lot of fun. And then I saw the, I saw the, the WB8s in port. And I ran up with my camera, it's like, oh, fantastic, you know? I'm going to have my work on the side of this monumental 10,000-ton vessel. No, it was what looked like Times Roman Bowls. <laughs> but it was, I was excited for a moment. This over here, basic, is something that I did as an internal branding face for uh, Scott Burnett at uh, Dublin Studio AAD. Uh, they wanted a face for their own use, single weight uh, grot. This is the name they wanted for it. And the way they briefed me was just exemplary. They pulled together, this is, these are some of the PDFs that they gave me. They pulled together a collection of typefaces that had the spirit they wanted. They didn't want any of those forms, they wanted the spirit. And a collection of typography done by other studios, not them, that again, had the spirit they wanted, had the personality that they wanted. I went to work with them and fairly rapidly because of the excellence of the briefing and the direction, we came up with something like this. Now, when I first came to them, I came with something, I thought like, oh great, like one of these great old, you want a really plain workhorse face, I'm gonna do sort of a revival of one of those, you know, not a revival of a specific face, but that sort of Miller and Richard workhorse jobbing faces you know, that were used to just bang out, you know, uh, flyers. And, and it's like, he said, yeah, a lot of this is great, but I don't need the eye, eye glass G. I don't need this little meat hook, you know, inward curve that you put on the terminals. I want a bigger X height. I want, oh, you know, it's like plain, 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 plain. And he scraped all that 19th century stuff back off. And I began to see, oh, God, he doesn't want just something that nods at workhorse plane 
typeface tool for clear communication, he really wants it. So I went back and we came up with this that I was really happy with. And at the bottom, you can see the logo that I did for them. They had a stencil version of ITC Grouch that they've been using quite well for a number of years. So I did this logo for them as a stencil version of BASIC and, of course, popped it into the font so that they could use it, you know, they wouldn't have to worry about chasing, you know, AI files around. They'd always have it. They designed these beautiful notebooks with it. Again, their work, not mine. And when the period of exclusivity ran out, I just thought, I have to take this very and I created Ballinger, my first uh, grotesque, named for the great and unknown uh, Ameri mid-century American graphic designer and layout artist, Raymond A. Ballinger. And I gave it a full set of weights. I gave it italics, and uh, I put a subtle OG curve into the legs of the italics, and I wasn't sure whether it was too much, but I wanted something to warm it and make it just a little bit, a li I didn't want to go full cursive, but I also didn't want uh, something that was simply oblique and fix the optical errors, you know? And I couldn't make up my mind, so I actually wound up doing an online poll, <laughs> po posting, examples of this wiggly and not wiggly and saying which which way should I go wiggle or not wiggle and as it happens wiggle one and here we are then I thought I can't leave it at that so we now have condensed and extra condensed weights and at this point there was no turning back so mono yeah so as you can see the thing's entirely out of control at this point oh yes one last thing uh, as a gesture of gratitude to Scott, who had gotten all this started, I did a special cut of Ballinger that he could use to replace the basic, and I gave him a stencil mark at every weight so that he could um, use, you know, use his new mark and have it harmonize completely with whatever he was doing and whatever mood the piece happened to be in. Um, and uh, that was a little tip of the hat to somebody whose direction was really important in making this happen. Uh, one of the things, if there's any type designers here, one of the things that I think you'll agree with is that you learn more from other people's use of your typefaces than you learn from almost anything else. So um, I've had the luck to have a lot of really strong designers in Dublin my stuff. Uh, this is uh, the website for the publicists, of, uh, Dublin Office of Publicists, who have put together their own branding based, uh, to a certain extent, based on Ballinger. Uh, it was designed by uh, an independent uh, web designer, Marcus Swan, under the uh, direction of James Keller. Here is Young Hearts Run Free is a cultural concern in Dublin that creates music festivals and other uh, cultural events, the proceeds of which go to Simon Communities to help the homeless. Uh, my friend Niall of uh, High Tone Design Studio has been, uh, has, been, has, has been working with them for some time. And here is a festival poster that he did for them. The guy, uh, uh, Paul Guinan, is uh, currently working as an independent designer who runs Sunday Books IE, did this for the Open Festival, which is a, another cultural event, uh, this one for the benefit of children. And he gave Ballinger a really thorough workout. I mean, he used God knows how many weights and God knows how many widths. And uh, I'm just really pleased with the way that it turned out. Again, his design, not mine. Here is both Center and Vibro, used by Simon Roche of Bureau, for another music festival. One of the things that's nice is that for some reason the, I mean, I don't have to talk to you about the Dublin music scene, it's kind of famous, but a number of people associated with this, with this and Simon is somebody who actually does DJ on the weekends, uh, have gotten into some of my stuff, you know? They've gotten, and so I see uh, 
you know, I see my type used for events that I myself am not remotely young or cool enough to go to. And Vibro came with uh, that set of ornaments that I knew no one would ever use. Well, Connor and David, a work group, I had no sooner made this available than they did a branding and interior graphics job for a coffee shop called Five Points, where they used these uh, things, not only used these things, but used them a yard high, which was great to see. Um, they didn't use the devil face or the skull, but you can't have everything. This is Precio. Detail Design Studio did a huge environmental graphics package for the new headquarters of and I just, Brent Thornton, okay, the uh, consulting firm, and it's like Precio in, you know, computer cut MDF and uh, in paint, in vinyl, in silk screen, all over the building, and it's, uh, it's a kind of a nice thing. Um, I do a visiting lecturer job at uh, IADT, uh, one of the wonderful design schools in Dunleary, and this was... Uh, a branding for the student show done by Shona Buckley, a designer who, even as an undergraduate, was one half of the very fine design firm It's OK. She used this with the blobby rainbow colors uh, for the website and for the branding for the student design show. What happened is when they had some of these things left over and a uh, Fashion student at IADT, who's, what is her name? Sorry. I'll have it in a moment. I do want, and I've lost it. Actually made a dress out of cut up posters from the show. I'll find that later. Elizabeth Freeney. Elizabeth Freeney. Well, the, the Dublin based designer who did this was me at Signal for my. A, you know, construction firm using Precio, my construction firm client. Here is Precio Stencil uh, from Niall McCormick again at High Tone for another gig poster. And yet another gig poster by Aidan Moore of Unthink, although he was working as an independent for an event at the Bernard Shaw. Here's Spinoza being used by Claire Bell at IADT, at, uh, uh, sorry, DIT. Uh, one of the three very fine design schools. And uh, Simon Sweeney, who is the other half of It's OK, and Shona Buckley's partner in Art and Life, designed this album cover with Spinoza while he was at work group working with Connor Nolan. So it is a small world there. At Post, we have uh, a series of designer, a series of posters designed to promote signals. Uh, own releases designed by Sean Mungie and Mike Simpson there. And again, I gave them the faces and let them run. And uh, this is what they came up with. Then there, I, I am still, the work is still ongoing. Uh, this is a branding face I'm doing for uh, a, an Irish newspaper. And because it hasn't gone public yet, I can't tell you the name, but I have to tell you what a pleasure it is to be asked to draw a Sarah face every now and again. And here we have uh, a work in progress, and this is through uh, CI Studio, Mel O'Rourke at CI Studio. And here we have a brand new face <laughs> for a government client that I'm doing with Rocky Grinnell at Design Works. And again, I can't, I can't tell you which agency this is either, but there are two ways. So it's legit. <laughs> and this is an interesting collaboration that is maybe a little bit too Irish to be believed. James Delaney is a very fine young graphic designer, web dev, and speculative designer. And he is a bit of a, is, is there a speculative designer in, in the house? Is there people looking at each other and smiling? <laughs> this is a kinetic sculpture, a computer-driven kinetic light sculpture that he has been making for the last year. Uh, and here is a picture of it. It doesn't work quite yet that he posted on social. And we were together at Dice Bar one evening 
when he said, you know, I was thinking that this thing might even be able to spell out messages, but, you know, I, I, that would probably too, be too difficult, you know, to have it create letters. And no, I said, not, uh, not at all. And I dipped my finger in my Guinness, because, of course, we were both drinking Guinness, and I sketched out a hexagonal grid on the uh, bar and started forming letters over it. And he snapped it with his phone so that he'd have it for future reference. And he said, what would you charge for doing this? And I said, next round's yours. And uh, here is the typeface. <laughs> It's not a miracle of readability, but it does work with the hex grid, and it is true to the spirit of the beer smeared over the bar. <laughs> and uh, he's still working on this because, you know, he's teaching himself electrical engineering as he goes, basically. Um, here is a still from a video in, pro in progress, but uh, one of these days this thing is going to be able to spell out letters, and I'm looking forward to it. Then there are some I get approached by people, sometimes young designers, sometimes not so young. Where there's a lot of interest in type design in Dublin, and people sometimes want to show me their works in progress, or ask me how do you get started, or whatever. And so there's been, I've been trying to mentor some of them. One of them is uh, Sean Mongi, who is one of the directors at Post, uh, with one of Dublin's best youngest but one of its best design studios and uh, we've been started designing typefaces together this is auger and auger mono uh, we that we are hoping to release later this year auger is interesting in that the mono came first and once we had the mono the way we liked it we it's not really very visible here but we did the minimum possible to make it proportionally spaced so that it would read more smoothly uh, mortis is another face that we're doing together. Uh, here is another lovely young guy named Archie Eastlip, who used to work at Work Group. Kosetsu, he says, is Japanese for snowfall, although I can't find any translation software that agrees with him. <laughs> and uh, when he was in school, he made a board game called Kosetsu, which was played with bits of triangular cardboard on a, you know, sort of a isometric raster uh, grid. And then he started forming letters and that inspired him to create this typeface, which this is not a collaboration. This is me sort of coaching him a little bit. The design is his. I'm hoping to release it through Signal sometime before the end of the year. Upsetter is from Niall McCormick. This is based on an old... Uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Garrett uh, type treatment, uh, which in turn was based on unknown designer's type treatment for a reggae-influenced punk band from the late 60s called The Upsetters. So that's where this came from. I believe Malcolm Garrett knows about it and has blessed it, um, even though it's not his intellectual property. And again, this is something where I'm kind of trying to coach another uh, designer through it, and I hope to release it later in the year. And I'm still working on my own typefaces. Of course, Ballinger needs to support Cyrillic, including Bulgarian and Serbian, of course. Uh, Dashiell is going to be a new book face. Center is going to be a sharp-cornered version of Center. And this is an interesting thing. The, Two years ago, there was a Bowie Festival in Dublin, and uh, Image Now, who curated the, uh, this uh, ex poster exhibition, invited 27 designers, Dublin designers, to each do a poster representing each of Bowie's 27 studio albums. And I was given black tie, white noise. Uh, now, I thought about this, this typeface that I abandoned a few years back because the thing started just looking to 90s. And then I had another listen of white, black tie, white noise, and I thought, you can't be too 90s for this album, you know? So 
the designer republic-ishness of it became a feature and not a bug. So I dusted it off and I worked it out. That stuff at the bottom that looks a little like flames and a little bit like the audio level readout on the front of an amplifier is actually the complete lyrics to White Tie Black Noise. Black Tie White I, I, I don't actually like the album, but I had a lot of fun doing it. And the typeface itself, which I'm calling Glamo, will hopefully be out uh, uh, sometime again in the sometime sometime within the coming year. So uh, I often tell students that the practice of design is about relationships. Your relationships with your clients, I've always felt, are relationships. They are proper relationships. You know, they are relationships like a relationship with your spouse or your sweetheart or your friend. You know, and they. They're not interruptions in the practice of design. The communication in those relationships is central to the practice of design. Like any other relationship, you need to work at it. You know, there needs to be mutual respect. There needs to be honesty. There needs to be clearer communications. And what applies to clients applies to colleagues and to collaborators. And I don't think there's hard lines between those three sorts of relationships. Relationships form a community. Community opens up possibilities for collaboration, and collaboration brings you to new places and new sources of inspiration. So, six years ago, I went to Ireland, and I found community and inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your patience. That ran longer than I expected it to. Uh, are we being kicked out? Yeah. Or any questions? I see. I see. Can, can we can we bring the lights down so that I can see people waving at me? Okay. Hi. Hi. There's a question. How did you know that the the punch the in the zinc oxide? Oh. Was that cut by hand or was that? No. 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 I'm sure. Okay. First of all, I don't do that kind of work, okay, yeah. but I'm rel and that that was not CNC cutting. Mm -hmm. That was I'm fairly sure old school acid bath. Oh, okay. You know where they coat the surface so that you put it. You know, and, uh, you know, coat the image of the letter, put it in an acid bath, and let the rest of it get eaten away, and then you do a little bit of final polishing. But like I said, I don't actually know how that stuff is done. I'm not a letter press printer. Okay. Yeah. So you talked a lot about like splitting this difference between like oh we we, we like something but we want a little bit more Irish. But uh -huh. um, how? And you said that like Ireland's like pretty like new at least as a country. So yeah. how did you find or like what were your shorthands to finding ways to like put that flavor into it? I, I saw that you had lots of like vertical stems having a little bit more motion in them yeah. necessarily. But like how did you go about it? Because sometimes like the Irish. Like idea can be like a, like um, a stereotype of a stereotype on itself. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. don't want pub sign lettering. You don't want diddly eye. Unless you want it. And what? Well, unless it's pub sign. Even for a pub sign. In point of fact, if you see Irish pub sign lettering uh, on a pub, you know it's a shit pub. You know that <laughs> it's, it's for tourists. You know, because all of the older, all of the pubs that have got real old signs on them are going to be more English looking. Because that's just the way lettering looked back then. Um, and when you see that sort of unsealed stuff on a pub, that means somebody's going for the tourist trade, somebody's idea of Irishness for a non Irish <laughs> audience. Um, yeah, there are certain shortcuts, and everybody uses them, and it's kind of tiresome. There's, you know, the, the bow legged capital A, you know. There's giving a little bit of camber to stems. The thing is about if you try to adapt insular forms, it's very difficult to make them modern. Um, and it's very difficult to make them readable because insular forms, I mean, they're, they're just dominated by all these circles and half circles and so forth. They're incredibly wide, you know, uh, like the Book of Kells, much of which was as apparently not done by Irish monks, much of it 
was done by English monks and like, yeah, there were so many different hands in it. It was farmed out. It's such a vast work. It was farmed out to a lot of different places um, over a number of years. So yeah, um, there's a certain feeling amongst a lot of clients that if you make something funny looking enough, it'll be Irish. Um, and it's, it's hard to get around not falling back on the same kinds of, uh, you know, tropes and moves over and over again. Uh, so, <coughs> if I'm hoping that this will continue as the, as the Irish get more used to, uh, right now commissioning type is something that is a very new sort of a concept over there. It's not like they never heard of it, it's just they don't do it. Yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, our Irish culture is a lot of it, you know, this sort of cliched, stereotypical expression, I share its ground. You know, it's a stoic culture in many ways. You're not supposed to fuss over trifles, which makes it tough for somebody like me who fusses over trifles professionally. If you're not going to fuss over trifles, if you're going to say, ah, sure, it's good enough, what do you want with somebody like me? Use it full font. It's it, you know it's it's like it's it's a hard sell, and also people don't like to spend much money over there, um, <laughs> especially in a downturn. Uh, but now institutions like Onpost are and so forth are beginning to commission their own faces, and eventually we're going to have to find new stuff to do because they're not all going to want to have the same typeface with a slightly bowed legs. So what do you use for inspiration, then, like, necessarily? Well, as you can see from what, what's over there, most of the work that I did wasn't terribly uh, Irish. You know, it's major institutions struggle with that and want, you know, want to assert some of that. And I think some of that has to do with the fact that they are part of a culture which was systematically suppressed by a brutal colonial government, uh, a brutal and sometimes genocidal colonial government. But some people want to put a lot of distance between themselves and that on the same time. I mean, some people want to say, can we make it Irish, can we make it up modern? And some people want to say, oh Christ, I don't want it to look Irish. I want it to look modern. I want it to look like something that's part of the global uh, you know, design scene. What do I look for for inspiration? It varies from client to client. There's no one single source of inspiration. With the uh, with the uh, the Matt Darcy work, I looked at the Matt Darcy archives a lot, and I looked a lot at old what whiskey packaging looked like anywhere from a hundred to two hundred years ago. You know. And none of it was DVI. For instance, the idea that you wanted Irish whiskey to look Irish, that was sort of like, no, you wanted it to look English so that people would know it was quality. Because there is this feeling that you have to go to London to have things done properly. You know, or in the case of Aaron Lucas, to New York. <laughs> uh, so, it, like, like I said, Irishness is much more of an issue there than Americanness is for American clients, I find. You know, unless you're working for the federal government or something, which I haven't done. But not everybody wants to be Irish. Some people distinctly want not to be Irish. And you know, you have to take each client as it, as, as it comes. And you have to do your research and draw your, senses, your, your inspiration from what's going to be right for that client and for that client's goals. Um, so it varies. So I'm not answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, well you take the history where it is. So yeah. if it's no, not Irish, it's not yeah. Irish. Yeah. You know, what's relevant to that particular yeah. job. That's a great answer. Yeah. Okay. Anybody, anybody else? Anyone else? Evans. Okay, um, well, hi. So you didn't really go into sort of like the inspiration for the typefaces. Uh, yeah, well, I was, I mean, at that point I was trying, 
I, I've been talking for what seemed like three or four weeks, and I haven't gotten to the Irish stuff yet. So no, I didn't. Uh, Spinoza came out of a love of mid-century German text faces by people like uh, Hermann Saff and uh, Georg Trump. And I mean, Trump and Evil was probably the biggest possible inspiration. There's a certain amount of Dutch in there too, but that's what that came out of. Uh, I wanted something sturdier, I wanted something in a full range of weights, and I also wanted something that was mine and not theirs. Um, it took 11 years to do that partly because I was, you know, teaching myself type as I went. I, I'm not formally trained in any of this, uh, but also probably because I kept changing my mind, and also because uh, Robert Stone, the novelist, once said, in your first book you always try, you try to include everything you know into your first novel. And like in this first time phase, it was like, I tried to put everything that I liked into that first time phase. And that's ridiculous. That doesn't work. One of the things that I love about commissions is that they focus you. You can't go wandering all around the meadow. You know, you have to get your test words to the client typically in, let's say, three weeks. You know, maybe a month, maybe two weeks. And then you sell, you know, maybe you go through a couple rounds of that, you sell something in, and that's it. You've made your design decisions. And now it's all about how do you fulfill them as well as you can. You know, and it's great. It prevents you from wandering in circles for 11 years, which is, you know, what you can otherwise do. Uh, anyhow, that is Spinoza. Uh, Vibro was just... You know, I like stripes as stripes, and I also just remember, you know, I grew up in the psychedelic era. You know, I'm a little hippie. And uh, I just really liked the idea of doing something that was stripes and nothing but stripes. I'm not the only person who's ever done it. Um, but it was something that I just enjoyed. Uh, so I made you move your camera. Yeah, sorry about that. Shall I, shall I, shall I go back? Oh, you're okay. Okay, I'm okay. Uh, center. Uh, probably, probably my least favorite effort so far. And I think it had to do with me. I originally wanted to do something like a microgramma, uh, your stile, for the dawn of the 21st century. Something which would reference concepts of modernity it was meant to be a little bit retro-futuristic, um, but also I had an eye on the market and what I thought. And I mean, you have to do that. You can't spend, I mean, for something like Vibro, I did it because I goddamn well felt like doing it. And if somebody wanted to license it, fine. But if you're going to do a big family, you have your own family to think about. And you cannot actually do a retail job on spec unless you have some faint idea that eventually it will feed that family for, you know, the equivalent of the length of time it did you to, it to, to design it. So I probably was looking over my shoulder too much with that, and I'm not entirely sure with the way, it came again, the way it came out, but center the sharp version, again, I did, that, I did a lot of that before anyone in Ireland used it, and then Post, who wound, who wound up working with me on a job that I didn't show here, you can't show everything. I said, well, the center was part of the branding. And I said, well, what do you think of it? And, you know, trying to get an Irish person to say something, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you have to pull it out of the tractor. It's very interesting being a New York Jew married to an Irish woman because Irish people, they're great talkers, but they'll never tell you what's on their mind. And, you know, New York Jews, we're, we're the whiniest people in history. So, I mean, there's a bit of a culture clash there. Uh, I finally got them to say, well, the rounded corners make it look kind of dated. And, you know, you have a spurless G. Could you have a spur on that again? Like, they made a couple of efforts. So I said, okay, let me, let me stick a spur on those things that you think would be better with a spur. You may be right. And let me sharpen up the corners. And I slammed through it in a 
a week. You know, less than. I had other things going on too. It's like, God damn, this is a big improvement. So I think when I have center finally out in the world, I'm going to switch from center to center for my own branding face. Uh, God, what else? Ballinger. I did talk about yeah. Ballinger. And that was uh, a conversation about the great old workhorse grotesques. Right. And that's how it came And that brings us mostly up to date. Yeah. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. I think. Oh, yes. No, no. Uh, thank you for sharing all the identity, all the typographic identity work. It's uh, amazing. Thank you. I do ask uh, advice about briefs from clients. For example, some clients, they know exactly what they want. They are, oh, this work you've done two years ago, mm -hmm. it's very success. Did you make it a magic? Just happen again? Yeah. And then some clients, they say, oh, just, they don't really know what they want. So like, yeah. Be famous. <laughs> As I will brief. Yeah. And then sort of like go back and forth. Mm -hmm. and then it's like, As a de designer, do you have any like, advice how to help clients to find their like, the various clients client. Uh, there's a few things that I do fairly reliably mm -hmm. with both branding clients, mm -hmm. and sometimes I wind up doing it with people who are commissioning faces. I say, I want three, I want three descriptors from you. You know, a maximum of three. These are going to be, what do you want to convey here? And they have to be emotion words. You know, you can't say, you know, the largest and best established, you know, you know, manufacture ball bearings in the eastern seaboards. Like, no, 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 no. Don't give me your business plan. Tell me trustworthy, or tell me exciting, or tell me, you know, venerable, or tell me, you know, edgy. Edgy is a tough one because you know, you, you, you talk to middle-aged, and I say this is somebody who's already done being middle-aged. You talk to middle-aged designers, say, oh, edgy. I want something edgy, and it's like. Well, <laughs> no, actually, you don't. I can tell. I can tell you right now. Anybody who asks for something edgy would shit if you gave them something edgy. <laughs> what they mean is like early MTV is what they mean when they ask for something edgy. Uh, so anyhow, I say I want these three words from you, and I also frequently say, who do you admire in your space? What are the brands? you like and what do you like about them and forget about your space I want you to give me some brands you just like the look of you know and you can tease it out of that sometimes you have to sell people off they know exactly what they want and it's terrible you know I try not to impose my taste on things but you know if they want to look modern and they think the way to do it is with gradients and spurless sizes you have to have a little talk and there's a lot of that going around because a lot of people, especially in, in Ireland, a lot of people in positions of authority are middle-aged guys and a few middle-aged women who had their ideas of modernity form when they were young. They formed their ideas of modernity around 1995 and they haven't updated them. And I have to explain what was modern then looks really dated now. It puts you in the company of all those people who would kind of like to look modern, but aren't because the people who are modern wouldn't dream of this stuff. Uh, so you have to go back and forth. Uh, but yeah, asking people who they, to give examples of what they admire, mm -hmm. and making it three words. Mm -hmm. Two or three words, not sentences. Now, I'm often given briefing documents from other branding studios, and it's like, oh my god, the list of things they think they're communicating with their little buggy and their two Pantone chips and, and, and their font is, you know, it's, it's three pages. And it's just one business bus goes after the other. And you know that they're giving the same thing, you know, slightly updated to every client. You can't do that. You're not going to communicate 19 things. You're going to communicate one, two, maybe three things. Tell me what those three things should be. Uh, so did that, was that yeah. responsive? Yeah. OK, great. Uh, is anybody else interested, or are you dying to go out and, and get a drink? <laughs> Drink it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.